I was like, oh, Jarl was just here? And they were like, yeah, it was bad. He took uh, too much Xanax and he had to lay on the floor and did his set laying on his back on the floor because the room was spinning. I did that in Beaumont. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, tell me that story. You know what the most outstanding thing from this story is? What? That at 4 o'clock Saturday night, I called Slade Ham's brother. He was a wigger. Yeah. He's a rapper at the time. This is 2005. The longest yard which just came out. I'm in Beaumont, Texas. I told the story on Mark Marin. It was not, not the Mark Marin podcast and the TV show. It was not a lie or not a scripted thing. That was a personal story that I went, the guy picked me up, I got in the car, and I go, and I was, I'm fucking lit. I had 30 Valiums, 30 10 milligram Valiums in three days. Drinking Jägermeister. Ask Josh. Oh, Next time shit. you get Josh Wolf, ask Josh Wolf. Go, Josh Wolf, tell me the story about Joey Diaz in Beaumont, Texas. They know about Thursday. I went down there, but anyway, I went to buy Coke, and they were neo Nazis. I'm talking, it's behind Beaumont, Texas, a neighborhood behind Beaumont, Texas, so it's a little bit on the rough end. Shit. And I went down there, and Slade told me, his brother goes, Listen, before we go in there, I just want you to know they ain't friendly with fucking people if you're scared. I said, Listen, you see this? There's four hundred dollar bills here. Everybody loves four hundred dollar bills. I don't give a fuck who you hate. Yeah. And I went in there and they talked to me. They even asked me what nationality I was Cuban. I was jawing out of my fucking mind. I couldn't even talk. Yeah. Uh, the volumes had me going. I was talking like this. <laughs> it was horrible. That was the last memory of that weekend. Really. And then you had to do a show that night. I did the show Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I flew in Thursday, and the kid was supposed to have the blow for me, and he goes, I got no blow. I go, what can you get me? What can you do? And he goes, I get your value. He told me, and I gave him whatever the price was. And I, he goes, it's 30. I go, fine, just bring me 30, whatever I don't need. I'll bring him back to my friend in L.A. I had a friend yeah. in Hollywood that ate value. I was like, I'll bring him back for him. Yeah. I started popping him. Popping him. First night, like I ate one, then two. Then I went to the fucking bar, and I drank a little bit. I didn't get coked up the first night. Went back to the hotel, got up, did some radio. You know, went back to the room, felt okay. Felt good. Yeah, popped another one to sleep at three. Your slept. nerves feel good. That's the crazy thing about those. Slept till about six, got up and was a little groggy. Had some coffee, had a couple fucking camel lights. You know, had some fucking Papa Do's and went to the show. And at the show, I started popping. Once I knew the coke was coming... I started popping them on Friday night, popping them, popping them, popping them, and they were in a little brown bag, so I wouldn't count them. I would just pop them like fucking Tic Tacs. Friday night, I was gone. I must have gone to bed at 1, and I slept till 3.30 the next afternoon. One of those things, you just wake up, your stomach's empty, yeah. you're fucked up. Like you need coffee, more coffee, a shower, another shower, you got to jerk off. You got to go for a walk, take another nap. It was one of those days, and I had two shows. And again, I went in the bag and took a handful and put them in my pocket. And the Coke came. And then we did the first show. And the first show, people were sending me Jägermeister. It's Beaumont, Texas. This was a great little comedy room that was owned by two guys. And the one guy rubbed the other one. Then the guy hit him in the head with a bamboo thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of that fucking tune. Sure. Tremendous, tremendous. Sure. It was first owned by two black people. And they were very successful. A black couple with kids had a theater in Beaumont, and the kid was a bartender. And they quit the business. The kid that was the bartender opened up his own club. He's still in Houston. He's a great kid, Slade Ham. So this Saturday night, I'm at the club. I got the package. I'm not hitting it. I'm on stage still. So I wouldn't do coke on stage or before. I would do coke afterward. Yeah. So I do the first show, and I'm fucking hammered. Because that Valiums I took Thursday and those ones I took Friday, they're still in your system. Oh, they don't go anywhere. Percolating like a mother. Holding on to fat cells. Holding on to fat cells. And every yeah. time you hit a joint, you get even more fucked oh. up. It ignites one of those fat cells. Every time you have a cocktail, it just pulls <laughs> them out of the fat cells. It pulls like, them out of the fat dance. cells. So if you eat a 10 milligram Valium, your fat takes half of it. Five milligrams get, gets released in your bloodstream. The other five go in your fucking fat, and they just get stored and stored, and here you are doing gin and tonics. You don't even need Cosby to show up. Nature works <laughs> itself here. After three nights of eating Xanax, chicks will tell you they black out. I know tons of chicks who uh, eat those Adderalls and all that shit, and they black out when they fucking drink. Yeah. That shit adds to it, so don't think that. So here I am, 
400 pounds, sweating profusely on stage. I'm so hammered. The first show, I got to lay down. They're sending shots. I'm drinking 16 shots on stage. I'm 400 fucking pounds. I already got the eight ball. It's fucking beige. It's beige. It's beige. <laughs> this Coke was right from the cartel. Right from the cartel. Right it's there. beige. Oh, my God. It was beige. And when it smelled through the paper, like I could smell the fucking ether right through the paper. I was like, oh, this is going to be a good night. I'm going to go back to the hotel room. I'm going to take a fuck. And I, and I had a plane from Houston at like 7.30 in the morning. Shit. I'm like, I'm going to fucking snort this fucking eight ball. I'm going <laughs> to drink. And all of a sudden, I go to the fucking bathroom. I come out of the bathroom, and there's a broad waiting. And she's like, do you want to do a couple of line of Coke? And I got the Coke in my pocket. But she's got some. <clears throat> and she, I go, what do you want to do? You have a car? And she goes, no, my husband's here. Let's do it in the woman's bathroom. So we go in the woman's bathroom, we do a few bumps in the woman's bathroom, she leaves. And next thing you know, I fucking pass out. I get up, the coke is still there, my money's still there, the phone's ringing, I can't fucking even, I can't move. Uh, yeah. Bert, it was horrible. I definitely OD'd. If it wasn't for my blood type and my experience, I would have been dead. Because I remember getting up, and the guy's like, you gotta check out or give me $48. And I just gave him like a 50. I go, I don't even, I couldn't even talk. I went back to bed, got up at 8, puked, went back to bed. I finally got a Monday and called my wife. Like, I finally called Terry, like, Monday. I'm like, Terry, you're not going to believe this. I'm fucked up. Yeah. And I stayed in that hotel room till Tuesday, and I had my friend come and get me and take me to this fucking thing. So what happened with the flight? <sighs> Who knows? I didn't come to till Thursday. Shit. I didn't really start talking like, I, at one minute it was Saturday, and the next minute it was fucking Thursday. Good God. That's like, that's how fucking deep I was into drugs. Then. But I was fucking sick till Thursday. And you know what? It took me years to eat another sleeping pill after that. That was, it was those bars. Those Zan bars? Those Zan bars, those are fucking that, Jack. Oh, dude. There, we had a, I had a friend uh, addicted to those, and they wouldn't even take him in rehab. Why? Because you gotta, I guess you gotta like, uh, benzos are the hardest to detox off of. They're real dangerous. On Sunday, this last Sunday, my mom was home and she goes, uh, your dad ate a pretzel when he woke up. I said, really? She's like, yeah, he was having anxiety and he thought a pretzel might fix it. And I go, did it fix it? And she goes, yeah, but he keeps calling me dude. Because you know, my dad's not a big weed guy. So all of a sudden he starts getting high. He's like, hey, dude, let's listen to some reggae, dude. <laughs> You know so what, yeah, he's, he's all over it. He when loves I, it. When I first went on Weight Watchers, I got off the edibles. Yeah. Really big. Like, I was like, and I was finding myself sleeping three nights and then having problems three nights. Frustration sleep problems. Yeah. Frustrating. Like, drinking NyQuil and fucking, you know, Ugh. because I mix it up a little bit. I don't let my body get used to one thing. I don't want it to get used to, like, what's the shit in Turkey? Tryptophan. Like, no. Tryptophan. Tryptophan. Uh, like, we'll drink tryptophan. That works two nights for Uncle Joe. Yeah. That's two oh, you nights. mean melatonin? Melatonin. That's two nights. Gaba gaba. That's two nights. God, have had that. Yeah. And then the other tea. That's two nights. The reefer. Two nights. You follow me? So, and then one night I'll take a fucking anxiety pill. Yeah. Which will put me out. I'll drink a half a beer. But for I wasn't. I, I wasn't. I'm always eating an edible. Yeah, all that gobba gobba and all that shit, that shit don't work. It don't work like an edible does. You sleep like a fucking baby. Really? When I eat edibles. I've never eaten edibles to sleep. Oh, my God. When you eat edibles those mints, Those night, mints work? Eat 200 milligrams of those mints. Oh, Joey. And you will sleep like a fucking baby. You'll be I don't think on, I would. I think I'd be up panicking. You'll be sitting on the couch here and go to sleep. My baby, <laughs> my baby, my baby, go to sleep. My baby, go to sleep, Bert, please. Lolly, 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 lolly. I'm telling you, I was watching the champ. Yeah. Last night when I yeah. got home, that he just signed over the horse. Just signed over. He just horse. signed over the horse yeah. at the betting parlor. Yeah. And he borrowed the 2000 from Faye Dunaway. 
and yeah. the, they, the bookie just came to the track to take the kid's horse, Ricky Schroeder's horse, and he beats the fuck out of the bookmaker. He beats the fuck out of him. Yeah. And next thing you know, I'm like, I gotta watch the rest of it because he's in jail. Ricky Schroeder, you ever see that movie? Jesus Christ, where the fuck have you people been? I know, fuck, oh, hasn't seen it. No, he's too busy crazy. watching Orange is the New Purple with fucking that other Some Americans, a pool jump is a shower. Oh. <laughs> yeah. There's some people who think by jumping in the pool, they get out and clean. They don't swipe their ass. Yeah. They don't scrub the nuts. The same way dead skin develops around your face and you got to get off of a loofah. Yeah. What do you think develops around your skin? When you get a, when oh. you come, you watch The 600-Pound Life. When you become one of those fat fucks and you stop oh, bathing. My daughters and, and I are obsessed with my 600-pound life. Is that the best show on television? It obsessed. The obsessed. best show on television. I watched four episodes. The two brothers that hated each other, those two morons. Oh. And the one brother that went, the one kid that was on pills, that the, finally, the kid finally said to him, you know, if you, the next time you fake pain and go to an emergency room and get a prescription, they're going to charge you with a felony because you've already exceeded the amount of lifetime prescriptions a person could get in Texas. Really? You know, when you're a fat fuck, I think that that show does something to yeah. you. Like you have to watch it and go, I don't want to be that person. But those people who that happens to, it's a toss-up. I sit there and watch it, and I wa listen to their words, and I watched their environment, and I think what happened. Like the fat dude was yeah. on pills. You know, what makes a person go, you know what, I lost my job. And part of it could be the beginnings of depression. But now the depression is worn off, and there you are 800 fucking pounds later. Yeah. It's, it was a weird thing about the show. It, like, there's a lot of people who whined on it, like who like pretend like they're trying to lose weight. There was a couple, like, women on the first, because I haven't had cable for a couple of years, so the for the first few seasons, there were some women who just, like, would just lie, and they had cameras in their faces. Well, nobody, nobody. Showing what they ate. Nobody is going to. Oh, yeah, everyone lies about what, I mean. It's, it, no, it's, uh, it's a sickness. Absolutely. Uh, oh. One kid that was eating, how many pizza pies, the kid up in New Hampshire. The brothers, that was the one kid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, kid yeah. had a, he would call his father from Houston to order Domino's for him in Houston. And the dad was in New Hampshire. Yeah. He was order. Was he not eating eight pizzas a day? It's, you know, I, 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 I don't, I deal with, uh, I think my real addiction in life is food. Meaning like, like tonight when I go home, it's going to be really, it's, it's a real battle for me to just go lay in the bed and go to sleep and I want to eat something when I get home like and I've been there where you just go fuck it and then you just start eating and you just can't stop you're like I'm already a you know and I but I've and I've been the biggest I was 265 and when I was at 265 part of you is just like I can't turn this boat around we're sailing so fast in this direction I don't know how to turn this boat around and then finally when you start getting momentum you're like oh there we go it's like it's like I don't know, man. I empathize with those people. I empathize with those people because I go, I feel like I'm, I've am i been there. I've been there. You oh, know, I was on my way. I would have been, absolutely. You were huge. Yeah, and I'm, I've am i gained like 15, 20 pounds back. I was I was 315. I got down to 227, and I'm 245, 247 right now. the longest yard for a second, the, the fucking, when we all jump into lakes. I forget you were bigger than this. Watch this. Like, I forget you were big. Like, whenever this is on... Like you scroll down and there's a scene that it says you're the longest yard comedy central. Yeah. If it's at like the hour mark, I'll put it on just to watch that scene and it makes me feel like the six hundred pound man. I forget I forget you were you big have, and I forget Segura was big. You gotta watch this scene. Like Segura still looks fat to me when I see no, him. No, <laughs> I saw him Friday. He looks tremendous. He's a fucking asshole. Yeah, he looks really good. He looks really good. <laughs> He really worked. Him and Rogan are like, Bert's gained all the weight back. Dude, I'm still 222. Two oh, seven, yeah. I was 217, and then I, I went back up to 222 the other day. But, uh, but yeah, I'm still 220. I'm, that's why I float at 220. Up and down. And so, uh, but I'd like to get, I, I don't know if I want to get, like, I don't know if I want to do my next special at 205. 
where I look good, like what are you at right now? Right now, two twenty, probably two twenty. Yeah, are you scared for your daughters at any point in your life? Do you uh, do you think about them when you're on the road? Yeah, I, I'm afraid. George is just such a sensitive, like really, like Georgia is the kid. For those of you that don't know, like I, I always tell stories about Isla, but Georgia is the kid that when when Mercy comes over to the house for Christmas Eve. Georgia tracks her the whole time, stays with her, plays with her, takes her into the room, remembers the shit that she had as a little girl, and goes, hey, Mercy, you want to try this? Hey, what, why don't I come up, hop up on the thing and play the piano? And Mercy also, Mercy's a, a like a comet. She comes into that house, and that is her home. She goes into Isla's room, starts going through her stuff, just walks around, comes out, talks to everyone, makes herself a plate, sits up on her dad's lap. Dude, Mercy is a comet. She She's a lot like, she's a, a mix of Isla and Georgia. Isla had that energy, but Mercy's also super sensitive. Like, very, like, there was another little kid there uh, this year, and Mercy was taking the time to talk to her, make and sure she's okay. fucking bang the head at the end of the night. I know. <laughs> I'm sitting there, and boom, and when you hear boom, you just <laughs> on go, a wood floor. You just do the sign of the cross. I hope that ain't my kid. And the kid was in shock, you know. But it's weird when she comes over how Mercy went, It's not it wasn't me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Georgia does take care of Mercy. Georgia does has that sympathy. Isla don't give a fuck. Isla, yeah. Isla just Isla, Isla locked her door. I go, What are you doing? She goes, Mercy's here. I gotta keep her out of my stuff, Dad. <laughs> I go, Isla, open your fucking door. She the uh but yeah, the Isla I, I'm Georgia's just so sensitive. She's gonna get her heart broke really bad. First guy she falls in first guy she dates, she'll fall in love with. And just get her heart broke. And I know that feeling because I'm that kind of person. And that's going to be the fucking. We just got to get her through that first break. Obviously, if you don't know it, Georgia is you. Oh, without yeah. Without the fucking t- t- Tito's. Yeah. Georgia is you without the Tito's. She's very level headed. I could tell that's how you were when you were younger. Yeah. She. Does she walk to that fucking bus thing in the morning? No. You both yeah, drive, we drive, back we, we and drive both of them now. I worry about my daughters, and I worry about what would, what would happen. Oh, would Mercy's going to be so fucking fine. That kid, that kid's got got that Oprah gene, where like nothing's going to hold her back. She, there's certain. I'm, I'm I'm reading this book called uh, Coddling of the American Mind, and they're saying the the phrase that kind of stuck with me was this phrase about um this I guess guy that worked for Obama. Set, when they were talking about kids being oversensitive and getting outraged, and and he said, "I want to teach you to deal with adversity. I don't want to pave the jungle for you. I want you to be able to figure out the jungle. If I take all the weights out of the gym, it's no longer a gym. The weights are there because it sucks, and that's what you got to do. And there's certain kids you need your kids to find adversity. And and I'll be if I may have made any mistake, it's been trying to protect my kids and not." let them run into as much adversity. I think that's a big fault of like the kind of parent I am. I think Leanne shows them more adversity. Says, you know, hey, if you want, go to Menchie's. You girls go by yourself. And I'm like, no, there's kidnappers out there. She's like, they're going to be fine. You did it when you were a kid. I was someone that can take adversity on the chin and deal with it. And Mercy's that same person. Mercy is, she's got your gene. I don't think so. Mercy's very sensitive. Really? Yeah. Dude, she runs around our parties like literally like she's selling cars. Like the like she just is so rough and tumble. Do you remember one of my favorite stories? This is my favorite story about your daughter. I've never we talk about this once once a month this comes up with my friends. Two Christmases ago, uh I get I get drunk super fast and I'm I'm a, too drunk. And then so I go into my closet to take a nap. I take a 15 minute nap. I disappear for 15 minutes. I wake up and I realize I need to jump in the pool. I need to get, I need to like sober up. I'm going to jump in the pool. So I throw on a Speedo. By the way, there's like 60 people at my house, right? Joey's family, all our friends, all the kids. I throw on a Speedo. <coughs> I, I come running out and I jump in the pool. And immediately Isla jumps in the pool. And then this kid Carter jumps in the pool. And then this kid Max jumps in the pool. And then Georgia jumps in the pool. Everyone starts jumping in the pool. And all of a sudden, you see Mercy, and she's looking at the pool, and Joey goes, are you going to do it? And she sprints up to the pool and stops. And she goes, no, 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 Daddy. It's too cold. And Joey goes, come on, Mercy. And she goes, ah. 
And everyone's going, mercy. And she starts looking around, almost like Hulk Hogan, like, oh, oh. And then goes, no, 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 no. And then turns to Joey, smiles, and jumps into the pool. It is so damn cold. What, what did she say before she jumped Wait, What in? did she say? Hold my ring. Hold my ring. Ah, yeah. <laughs> she took, she had clothes on, Dude. sneakers, <laughs> the whole thing. Hold my and out of the whole thing, she goes, okay, daddy. She looks, she looks, she goes. Hold my ring. And she jumps in <laughs> and we fucking die. Dude, Hold the my fucking ring. place lost it. You got to realize there's 20 kids in the pool and we got this one like five, five year old on the edge. I mean, work in the crowd like Hulk Hogan. Like, should I give him the pile driver? And everyone's like, come on, Mercy. She goes, no, 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 no. And, every, and then all the moms like, you don't have to. And she's like, looks at Joey, hold my ring and just jumps. The like place went said, fucking nuts. I thought because she was at the tip and she you could see her little fingers are moving. Like she was nervous about it. She wanted to jump in. She had peer pressure on her. She wanted to swim. You know, she wanted to prove a point. But if you I know Mercy's little head, something was going on. Yeah. And finally she let us know, hold the ring. <laughs> hold my ring. Forget the sneakers, forget the socks. Forget my underwear. Forget the pants I got on, yeah. the shirt, the jacket. Oh, forget all that shit. <laughs> it's just hold the ring. Dude, that made us. And then I, this year she came over and I go, hey, Mercy, you jumping in the pool tonight? She goes, oh, no. Because <laughs> she didn't know it was going to be as cold as it was. She she jumped in and it's like 50 degrees. And she popped up just, you know, that look you just. <gasps> when your whole body hits yeah. your fucking bones. <laughs> oh, no. I worry about my mercy a lot. I worry about how to raise her, how to, you know, you see these girls in Hollywood and you've seen, you've been here a long time. Yeah. And you see that hole. You see that hole and you got to figure out how to fill that fucking hole, you know? Yeah. When women come up to me and tell me they want to be a star, that's, that, that, that's not normal. You know, there's got to be a work pattern. There has to be all these things. And there's times I like her at her school, but there's times I don't like that school because of who else goes there. Other than parents. And what they're talking about. It's like how Josh Wolf said they pulled this kid out of the school when he went to a kid's party and the alligator before he got killed was there. Oh, Steve Irwin? Yeah. He goes, I went to a kid's party. When they went to Carpenter? Yeah. Because I went to a kid's party and the guest was Steve Irwin with the alligators there. And he goes, and then I took my kid out of that school when he had a party and they gave away bags at the end, uh, party favors. Yeah. And the kid looked at the bag and threw it back at Josh. And he goes, last party we went to, they gave us Nintendos, like the games, all those expensive games. Yeah. And Josh is like, I got to pull her out of that. I got to pull him out of that, this environment. That's, yeah. But I try to toughen her up. I show her Narcos. <laughs> She watches Narcos with me. Yeah. I had her watching uh, Sopranos a little bit. She says things that blow me away where you just go, where's that Where's that coming from? <laughs> like, I, t- I told you, I, we were in Maui, and I'm, I got to fly to D.C. that afternoon, like at like 2. So I'm leaving at noon. So I wake up. I'm, I'm in bed with Isla. And I roll over, and I go, hey, baby, it's like 6 a.m. Sun's coming up. I go, baby, let's go downstairs, get a coffee, and I'll get you a donut, and we'll go down. And we'll watch the sunrise, then we'll go snorkeling before anyone wakes up. And she says, she goes, leave me alone. So I go, Isla. And now I'm like, now I'm like, <laughs> oh, no. now I'm rolled over and I got my head in her hip, like right, right between her hip and her ribs. I go, baby, wake up. Me and you go downstairs, get a coffee, get a donut, chocolate milk. We'll watch the sun come up and then we'll go snorkeling. And she, Joey, I swear to you, she rolls over, looks at me and she goes, you're tugging on a tiger's tail. And went back to bed. <laughs> That's that fucking kid. She just, I, and I go, in my head, like, she, I told you, I, I've told this joke a million times, but when I, she was a baby, she sat on my chest when I, when I was waking up, sat on my chest, woke me up and goes, guess what's in my hand? And I was like, I don't, now, now I'm fucking panicking. I'm like, I don't know. She goes, a punch in the mouth and fucking hit me. And I remember saying to her, I was like, this is really important, Isla. I go, did you come up with that on your own? Because I'm going to tell that on stage tonight. And she was like, yeah, yeah. I just thought of it. I, 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 it looks like a punch. Like, if you put something in your hand, it could be a quarter or a punch. I was like, fuck, that brain. You know, it's not, it's like, I, it's, I say it, it's not, like, going to be useful 
to society in any way that will reap the benefits, but someone's going to reap the benefits of it with a fucking pistol on a table and a pound of coke. This is how you get rid of a body. That's you're, Isla. You're tugging on a tiger's tail. You're tugging on a tiger's tail. And she went right back to bed. Yeah, and she says to us like that, when you fuck with her, she starts going, you're pushing a lot of buttons. One of them's going to be red. And you're like, what? I know. A dude, her brain works very differently. Now, don't get me wrong. She's dyslexic as fuck. She's getting her ass handed to her in school. Like, I mean, every year we're like, is she going to the next grade? Because she has a really hard time in school. Can't can't read barely at all. Like, but the truth is, man, her brain just sees the world very differently. And she makes, she's so funny. I mean, they were trying to do Yo Mama jokes. And her rendition of Yo Mama jokes were so esoteric, they didn't make sense anymore. Yo Mama's so poor, she has nuts in her purse every now and then because she wants to snack. And you're like, what? And she, but her, her brain just, it spins out, you know? Like, it just has, I don't know, man. Now, G is a genius. George, yeah, fucking. G, is, you, got, you got no she's beef perfect. with. She's perfect. A's, the homework, you don't have to tell her what to do. She, Independent. She re- reads. Very us. nice. Very sweet. Oh, very sweet. Very loving. She's in honors classes. No drama. No drama. No drama. Going to be a knockout. No boys yet. No, nothing. Nothing. Uh, still believes in, like, Santa Claus. Like, I mean, the youngest sixth grader in the world still believes in Santa, still believes in the Tooth Fairy, that Willie, we, we hide a little elf on the shelf everywhere. She still believes that he's magic and he watches her. Like, I mean, she's just like the, she's so perfect. And Isla's already skeptical. She, on one of, I, I have this, Joey, I have this, and I will post it on Twitter today. I have this. It is one of my favorite things ever. Isla on her Santa Claus list, maybe like two years ago, three years ago, one was, um, you know, I want a Polly Pocket. I want a. I want uh, La La Loopsies. I want a Barbie Camper. And then one of them was, I'm not even fucking with you. Mind you, Joey, she was six years old. She wrote, I want proof that your gang is real to Santa. I want proof that your gang is real. And then she took a fucking GoPro last Christmas and hid it on the mantle and started it. And I went and I saw, I saw it. She was trying to catch Santa Claus. Started it. So I go in. I fucking, we, I, I see it. It's fucking blinking red light in the middle of our living room. So I go in. I put everyone to bed. I have the video on my computer. On my computer. I won't post it because I don't, until they n- don't believe in Santa. I go into my bedroom. I go to sleep. I don't go to sleep. I just sit there for like fucking five minutes. Lights out. Everyone waits. I just walk right back in. I have a white mitten on. I have the bells in my hand. I get. I have a flashlight in my hand. I get underneath the by the uh, by the fireplace. I jump down and jingle the bells. Right. I flash the flashlight around. Priscilla doesn't move. She just sees it's me. Just stares. Goes. Puts her head back down. I, I reach my hand up with the mitten. I grab the GoPro. I turn it around and then I turn on the lights and I start walking around with bells and moving presents around. Then I take that vi- and then I let it play all fucking night long. I then take that video and I simply splice out. Me walking in the room on, on iMovie, I have, I have fucking 40 minutes of video. I splice out me walking in the room, and then it just looks like the room just sat still. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Santa shows up at the end. And then the next day I go, guys, the GoPro's dead. And I was like, Dad, Dad, we got Santa. We got Santa. So I, sh- I now, Mind you, I've done all the fucking work already. I've already, it took two seconds. You know how easy it is to yeah. splice out me walking into the room and getting under the thing. And I just take it. And I fucking let it play out for the whole 30 minutes. Like 30, 45 minutes. I let it watch the whole thing. And they're like, I don't see it. Fast forward, fast forward. I'm like, all right, I'm fast forwarding. All of a sudden, they see Santa. And Isla's like, holy shit. They see the glove come up. They see it turn around. And Georgia starts looking at me like, mind you, this is, I, I thought she'd stop believing. She started looking at me like, like she found Jesus. Like, holy shit, like Santa's fucking real. And I was like, I, I don't know what to tell you guys. My dad looks at me, he's like, I think you're fucking your kids up. <laughs> but yeah, man, they still fucking believe. I love, I love, I love the, the fun of being a parent. Like when they're still young and they're not, they're not broken yet. They're not fucking doing drugs. I mean, I'm, I was, in sixth grade, I was like two, I was one year off from drinking in sixth grade. I drank in seventh grade. was first I passed out one night really hard. And all of a sudden I wake up to the door banging. And it's Joe Rogan pre-marijuana when he was fucking miserable. <laughs> I always say he was an ape. You ever see the evolution of an ape? Uh-huh. That's when he was an ape. Yeah. If you didn't know Joe pre-marijuana, no, didn't, didn't. it wasn't. It wasn't. It was like a spurts. There was something missing. Thank God Eddie talked him into that. Because you didn't know what. He was anti-drug. Yeah. Anti-fucking-drug. You know, 
if 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 Bert came over and the next day he called me, you know, Bert Kreischer had like sixteen fucking beers. He's got a bad problem, you know. And he would just say that. I remember we went to see Doug Stanhope. That's how it started. And he's like, fucking Doug is funny, but somebody's got to talk to him about his alcoholism. I'm like, Joe, nobody says things like that. Like, nobody. I go, why would you say that? He goes, why would I say that? He had 11 beers and four shots of tequila on stage. That's how uptight Joe Rogan used to be. Because I don't even wow. recognize that guy. No, wow. no. He gave me, Ricky Cruz, and Ralphie May shit for smoking pot at the comedy store one night. Really? That's... That's how twisted he was then, anti. He was very by the book. You know, what's his name? He just died from drugs. Who, uh... The guy on Saturday Night's Live, his buddy on uh, news radio and all that. Oh, Phil Hartman. So Hartman. he was very... Well, he got shot, though. Right. Something yeah. had happened with Joe was, yeah. that he was very... And he, he would not discuss cocaine with me at that time. Like, he wouldn't... Talk, like, I wouldn't ever, ever be high in front of him. And one night, we all said goodnight. And I went back to my room, and I started watching TV. And I just passed out, guys. And I heard boom, 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 boom. It's Joe Rogan with the security. Joe, he opened up the door. Are you all right? What the fuck? We were supposed to be downstairs at 8.30. Now we missed our fucking flight and all this shit. I'm like, hold on. And he's looking around my room. And I'm like, no, dog. I went to bed last night. And the whole way there, him and Chris McGuire yakking. Like, I know he was with Danny Merlin. Chris last night. McGuire. I know yeah. Chris McGuire. That's when, when we used Chris McGuire and me used to open for Joe. I remember Chris McGuire. And I, I know and then Chris, we get to the airport. He's a head writer for all the, yeah. all the uh, roasts. All those roasts. Then we get to the fucking airport and the flight's delayed four hours. So all that yelling and screaming was for no fucking reason. I even told him. I go, see, the flight's yeah. fucking delayed. The it. machine in the motherfucking house. Happy New Year, Happy brother. Happy New Year, Joey. How are you? I feel. Fucking phenomenal. You got the DiMaggio gene is still on. And Mickey Mantle? The Mickey Mantle, whatever. <laughs> DiMaggio gene. Some guy that's dead. I want his gene. That's good. <laughs> I got the Mickey Mantle genes flexing right now. Yeah, right. Good. Yeah. yeah, I'm having, I'm fucking, dude, I go for, I start my tour tomorrow. Oh my God. I've never been more excited for, I'm, I couldn't sleep last night. I was excited to be on tour. And you know how it is. What it is, is we travel so much just doing stand up. And so you'd watch people, you know, like usually in the all community would be like, this is my tour. And you're like, it's just the road. That's what we do. It never ends. But this fucking tour, I, it has like a finite time out there. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah. I'm just going to go hard as fuck <coughs> for four months and, and, just, and just go. And this is everything you work for in this business. To do a big theater tour, do it in hit New Zealand, Australia, Europe. Dude. All the, I can't fucking wait. You taking the family? You, you, you're... Leanne's flying out tomorrow because I got a tour bus. So Leanne's coming out and we're she's stocking the tour bus, making sure it's got everything that I need. Like she's gonna buy a blender, buy like uh, sheets and blankets and stuff, chargers, lock it down. And then I'm on the tour bus all weekend. This weekend, Portland, Seattle, Calgary, Vancouver, and then come back for two days, and then I'm gone for the rest of the month. So you fly to Seattle. I fly to I fly to Portland with Leanne tomorrow morning. Okay, and then, and then there you take the bus. And yeah, two shows, two shows every night. Are you excited, really dude? I'm excited. So, I'm really excited. I've always wanted to have a tour bus. I've always wanted to be this, and I looked at it this way. You know how you've always taken p- good people with you on the road, and so you've always kind of had a, a family, like a community, and going with Joe. I never did that. I always let the op- I always let tried to foster the communities of comedy that I went to. So I was like, if I'm going to Omaha, I'm like, bring in a good local feature. Because he's gonna let him get the work, you know. That's you got to be give back to the community. I do that too. I do yeah, that. You do there's that certain, too. Yeah, certain markets, I bring somebody. Yeah, and there's certain markets I know that there has a good crop of feature acts. Yeah, and so and so sometimes it's great, and then sometimes it sucks, and then the weekend's long, and you're doing you're adding shows, and you don't know the guy, and you're not hanging out, and maybe he's got issues. So this year I'm taking I'm taking guys with me. We're all standing on the tour bus together, and I looked at it as just a party. Who are you Have taking a, with? Jesus Trejo. Oh, fucking great guy. Murderer, murderer, bro. Murderer. Uh, Shane Torres. Okay. Uh, Dave Williamson and Dusty. I dust. God damn it! I always fuck up Dusty's name. I think it's Dusty Slade. I don't think it's Dusty. And you Slade. switching them up? Yeah, switching them up. So it's like one week on, one week off for them, and they'll fly in on Thursdays and leave on Mondays, and then I'll probably on a couple of them I'm staying on the bus. Because we've added a Monday show and then no th- Tuesday show, but we're doing a Wednesday show. So I'm just going to stay on the bus and drive to the next city. And uh, it's great, dude. I got The girls are going to fly out and do a weekend with me and stay on the tour bus. They're bringing two friends because I got six bunks. So I'll have, th- I'll have four little girls hanging out in the tour bus, and they're going to love it. They're going to fly in Friday night, uh, grab them Friday night. They'll come 
go hang out the tour bus. We'll drive Saturday, go do something fun during the day. They'll hang out that night, Saturday night, and come home Sunday. Now you're taking your family to Europe with you. Girls are coming to Europe. All the girls coming to Europe and Australia with me. Jesus Christ. Yeah, but we're going to go. So I'm like, the European tour, I'm going to have them fly out to London or Paris. Maybe maybe Paris. They've already been to London. Sure. Paris is such a safe place. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I want my daughter. I want her in Paris. Because you're always thinking. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we're going to hang out for like a week. And then I'm going to start the tour. And they're going to come to like the first venue. But in, And same with Australia. Australia, I think I go to like, I do Sydney. And then I, ha- I know I do New Zealand. And then I have like a, like four days off. And so they're going to meet me in Sydney. And we're going to do some stuff in Australia. I can't wait. You documenting any of this? Uh I taught. I thought about it, but I didn't want to turn it into. I, I I wanted to enjoy the moments. I'm going to be on Instagram a ton. You know that, and so like I'm fucking all over Instagram. So I'll put it on Instagram. I'll probably shoot my own stuff. You know, like shoot it, put edit it, put it on, uh, put it on YouTube, and then I'm going to do. I'm going to set up a podcast on the bus. So I'm going to do some podcasts with people like Diamond Dallas Page. We're doing a podcast in Atlanta, so it's going to be work too. But I, dude, I can't fucking wait. The only thing that would make this better, and you know, we've always talked about this, is like me, you, Tom, Ari, Joe, all us, all us doing a tour like that together. That would be the fucking, that would be the dream. No, I talked to Tommy Easton. Okay, and he said he went to the Dodger game the other day for eighteen bucks. Right. Yeah. Now how the fuck people tell me that two hundred dollars the fucking seats? How does Tommy Easton go for eighteen fucking dollars? Well, it's a, it's the game time app, well, and there's other ones like it. But it's that's all it is. It is just. Uh, I mean, he sat in hell. He said, "Yeah, but he's in hell." Do you know they have a medical marijuana smoking section at Dodgers? No, no, they no. don't. Yes, they do. No, there's no, there's no way. That's what he told me. I'll call him right now. Are you serious? Yeah, that they have a smoking section and a medical. I mean, you got to walk eight miles. <laughs> By the time you get there, you're like, we might as well leave. We're by the bus station. <laughs> you know, we're all the way in we're fucking in Silver Lake. Yeah, we're in Silver Lake already. So I heard there's a medical marijuana fucking little smoke pad there. Listen, you're gonna spark about a fucking game anyway. There's yeah. nothing worse. You wouldn't this. be too nervous at a baseball game? Are you fucking kidding me? That's a home of sparking a joint. I remember going to a Yankee game one time and looking down and seeing crack vials. Yeah. In 1993. Holy shit! That's too much. Seeing little crack vials in fucking Yankee Stadium. People sitting there with a cigarette. You don't know it. You don't smoke crack. You just smell something, but you're. So enrolled in the game, you probably think it's popcorn. You know, I would hate to go to a game with my daughter, with your daughters, and yeah. for them to go, Daddy, what's that smell? Yeah. You follow me? I would hate to do it. So I think that uh, it's better. Just give them, a, listen, it's legal. It might as well be legal here. <clears throat> might as well be legal here. People smell it now and they go, God damn it. They go, what the fuck? 